your Bibles and turn with me this morning to the sixth chapter of the book of Ephesians. That's where we're going to be today. I shared this with the first service, and I mentioned briefly in the opening prayer that our team that's going to Moldova in about a week, um, we've got some last-minute things now to deal with. Um, and, you know, the Lord is so faithful and so absolutely wonderful. Um, if you've ever taught God's Word, ever preached God's Word, you know that very often the very first person He is teaching and the very first person He's preaching to is yourself. And I usually plan my sermons months in advance, and if you want to check out where we're going, it's on the webpage, you can see the schedule where we're going. And so I chose this passage, Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 17, you're probably familiar with it, the armor of God passage. I chose that for this Sunday, I chose that months ago. Uh, and this past week, in fact, yesterday, we found out that our flight into Moldova, we're supposed to link up with another team, we've got transportation arranged on that side, and our flight into Moldova has been pushed back five hours. So that changes the whole dynamic of our arrival and our transportation plan and all that stuff. And so we've got to figure that out. But I saw the faithfulness of God and that he planted this verse. This week I spent time studying all about the armor of God and we can stand firm in faith, and trust in who he is and trust he's, what he's going to do. And then this came up and I just had to say, the Lord just worked on me this morning and said, you remember all that stuff that you were studying this past week about how I can be relied on, how you can stand firm in me? This is the moment for you to do that. And so I just want to spend just a moment before we jump into the passage. And would you just pray with me this morning? Because I don't know what you're going through this week, and I don't know what you're facing or what, what battles are coming your way, um, but I just want to spend a moment in us just praying that as we take a look at this armor of God and what He has given us, the equipment and the, and the materials that He has given us to stand firm, that whatever you're facing in the coming days, that this passage would just speak directly to your heart. So would you join me in prayer this morning? Father, thank You for Your goodness, Your faithfulness. We just sang in that song that you go before us, you go behind us, you are the God of angel armies, you are on our side. You have given us incredible resources to stand firm. And thank you for the reminder in my own life. And Lord, I don't know what people are going through this week, what they've gone through in the last couple of days. I don't know. You do. You know it intimately. And so, Father, as we open your word this morning, as we're reminded of this incredible armor that you've given us, Father, I just pray that these words would speak directly to the hearts and to the needs of those that are here this morning. Lord, would you open up our hearts to hear what you have to say? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you've got your Bibles open to Ephesians chapter 6. We are, this morning, we're almost finished with our study we've been in the last several weeks on what the Bible says about the church, who the Bible says that we are as the church. And so we come to this familiar passage, this armor of God passage, and you notice if you saw it in the bulletin this morning, the title of the sermon this morning is The Lord's Army. Now, if you, you are familiar with that passage, you've read that passage, you realize he doesn't use that phrase anywhere in that passage. He never directly identifies us as the Lord's Army, but there's no doubt he's using a military analogy. And you remember a few months ago, we went through the book of Philippians. And as we started that book, we talked about the circumstances that were going on in Paul's life as he wrote that letter to the church in Philippi. And you remember I said then that that happened at the end of the book of Acts. The book of Acts ends with Paul in prison. And he's in prison for two years. And during that period of time, remember I said he wrote four letters during his time in prison as the book of Acts comes to an end. He wrote the book of Philippians. He wrote a letter to the church in Colossae, our book of Colossians. He wrote a letter to a friend and co-worker in Christ. His name is Philemon. We have the book that bears his name. And he wrote this letter, a letter to the church in Ephesus, the book that we call Ephesians. Now, that imprisonment, it was more like house arrest, you remember. Paul was in a house. He wasn't in a prison cell, so to speak. But he was chained to a Roman guard. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, there was a Roman guard right with him. And I imagine, as when Paul wrote these words, he was looking at that guard. He was looking at that Roman soldier, what he was wearing, the uniform and the outfit that that guard had on. And he looked at that guy and he said, he wears that stuff because he's a member of the Roman army and it hit him. 
The Holy Spirit stirred in his heart to say, that's exactly what your people need to know. He uses this military analogy, and though he doesn't directly call us the Lord's army, that is no doubt the idea he had in mind as he wrote about this equipment that we have. And what I want us to do this morning is to help us see through God's word that those of us here this morning that have a relationship with Christ, we are in the Lord's army, and God has given us some incredible spiritual weapons and incredible spiritual defenses because the battles that we fight in this world are spiritual battles. And so you've got your Bibles open to Ephesians chapter 6. I want to focus most of our time on the last several verses talking about the armor itself and kind of going through it piece by piece. But there's a couple of things we need to, we need to deal with, we need to talk about before we get to the armor. And so we'll start there. And the first one is this, that the battle is real. Spiritual warfare is an absolute reality. Look there just at verse number 12. Now, no doubt if you read this, this passage a number of times, this verse you've read a bunch of times, you've seen it on a bunch of posters and t-shirts. Verse 12 of Ephesians chapter 6. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the, the world forces of darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. There is a spiritual battle that is going on. You and I are involved in it, but it is a spiritual battle that rages, and I think there is, a, there is a tendency sometimes for us to forget that, to lose sight of the fact that the things that happen to us in this world are not disconnected from the spiritual reality of this battle that is taking place. Now, if there was anyone who knew that, any group that Paul had ministered to that would have understood not just the reality of spiritual warfare, but the significance of it, it would have been the Ephesians. I think they would have understood it better than anyone else. I'm going to ask you to keep your finger right here in Ephesians 6 and flip back with me to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19 was Paul's visit to, to the city of Ephesus when he founded the church there. And he shows up there in Ephesus, he finds these 12 guys who had been disciples of John the Baptist. And, and, he, and he talks to them, he teaches them, he presents the gospel, they come to know Christ, he baptizes them. But the other thing I want us to see in, the, in Acts chapter 19 is a little description of the city of Ephesus. The backdrop, both for what's happened as Paul founded the church and the letter that he wrote to the church in Ephesus. Acts chapter 19, let's start right there in verse 10. And this took place for two years. Now, this, the, the this that he's talking about is Paul had taken these 12 disciples that just had come to Christ. He was, he was teaching in the synagogue, as was his habit. There was opposition. He took these disciples off to a different place in the city, and he discipled them. He helped them grow in their relationship. And this took place for a period of two years. Paul stays two years in Ephesus. So that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. And God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. So that the handkerchiefs or the aprons that were carried from his body to the sick and, the, and diseases left them and evil spirits went out. God was doing some amazing things. Even the very clothes that Paul wore, they could take those to the sick and God was working miracles in a way that were just extraordinary. Verse 13. But also some of the Jewish exorcists who went from place to place attempted to name over those who had evil spirits in the name of the Lord Jesus saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Seven sons of one Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. And the evil spirit answered, and he said to them, I recognize Jesus, I know about Paul, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leapt on them, subdued them all, overpowered them, so they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the Jews and the Greeks who lived in Ephesus, and fear fell upon them. And the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. And many also of those who had believed kept coming, confessing, disclosing their practices. And many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of everyone. And they counted up the price of them and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. Now, let me, let me back up a little bit and say, just pull out a few things about the city of Ephesus that we see in that passage, this description of when Paul founds the church there. First of all, did you notice in verse 13 that the synagogue had exorcists. 
I mean, how bad did the, the demon possession, how bad did the, did the forces of evil, the activity of the forces of evil need to be in that city that the synagogue had exorcists? Now, if you're here first time with us this morning, we gave you a little welcome packet. And you flip through that, and you'll see flyers for all the different ministries that we have. And if you want more information about those, you can go on our webpage. And what you'll find there is we have a ministry for men. And we have a ministry for women. We have an awesome children's ministry, a ministry for youth. And you'll find all of those things. You know what you will not find? It's an exorcism ministry. Now, our ministries, like, like, like most other churches, and indeed I think like the synagogue there in Ephesus, are partly based on the needs that we see around them. How bad did the demonic activity have to be in the synagogue in Ephesus where they said, you guys are the greeters and you greet people as they come in. And you guys are the ushers and help us take up the, the offering. And you guys are the exorcists. The, the synagogue there had to have exorcism. Demonic activity was happening. In fact, we, we see this situation that takes place. The sons of the chief priest are trying to excise a, a demon in the name of Jesus. It's interesting. They're not believers in Christ, but they're using his name nonetheless. And the demon says, I don't have any idea who you are. And the, and the demon beats up these seven guys. Now, what I find almost a little amusing about that, sad in its amusingness, is that it's not the fact that the demon spoke through that guy that garnered any attention. It was the fact that the demon, this demon-possessed man, beat up seven guys, that word spread throughout the city. The fact that the demon spoke through that guy was almost a non-issue. How bad did the demonic activity have to be in the city of Ephesus? And then look down there at verse 19. Now, it says they're, they're bringing together all of their occult materials. That word magic in verse 19 is what we would probably call black magic nowadays. Imploring, conjuring up evil spirits to bring some calamity on another person. That's the kind of magic that they were practicing, a very occult activity. And it says they brought all those books together and they burned them. And the value of those books was 50,000 pieces of silver. Now, let me help us understand what, what kind of value we're talking about there. That piece of silver he's talking about, it's a, it's a Roman coin called a denarius. And one of those Roman coins was equivalent to the average person, the average day laborer's wage. When they worked, that would be what they would earn for one day's worth of work. 50,000 days worth of wages. Now, let me put it in perspective for you. In the United States right now, the median income is about $60,000 a year. So if you do the simple math on that, 60,000 divided by 365, the average day's wage in the United States is about $165 a day. So what would this be like in today's dollars? Eight and a half million dollars worth of occult material in this city. They bring it and they have this gigantic bonfire. This is the extent, this is the city they lived in. This is the city that Paul founded this church in. This is the backdrop. This demonic activity, this occult activity, eight and a half million dollars worth of black magic books. Now here's why I point that out. Flip back over to Ephesians chapter 6 again. I point this out for this reason. When Paul wrote this letter to the church in Ephesus, it's about five years after those events in Acts chapter 19. Now, demonic activity was that prevalent in the city of Ephesus, and yet five years later, he feels compelled, the Spirit moves him to remind them of the reality of spiritual warfare. How easy do we forget? How prone are we to forget the reality that the things that happen in this world are not disconnected to the battle that rages between the forces of God and the forces of evil? There is a spiritual battle. This battle is real. Our home group is using a study right now by Pastor Chip Ingram. And he said this in the course of that study. He said, why in the course of history has so much attention been paid to such a small group of people known as the Jews? He said, of all the major civilizations throughout history, in all of the, the great nations, listen, Israel has been neither of those. It, but by historical standards, it's not been a great civilization. It's not real, radically changed the world. 
by, by historical standards, it's not been a great nation. It's been a very, very, pretty small, almost insignificant nation by historical standards. He said, why, though, throughout history, have so many fought and tried to get rid of this seemingly insignificant nation? This is why. Because the nation of Israel are the people of God. There is a spiritual battle where the, the forces of evil are continually coming against the people of God. And you and I, as believers in the church today, we are the people of God. And we cannot think that if the forces of evil have been that persistent to try to do away with the nation of Israel, that they will not be that persistent in trying to do away with God's people now. The battle is very real. There is spiritual warfare. And the other thing I want us to, to realize before we start to look at the armor is this battle is serious. I think there is a, a tendency in our minds to downplay the seriousness of this battle. And, you know, but realize, understand this, there are no innocent bystanders in this war. In this battle that is raging between the forces of God and the forces of the enemy, there are no innocent bystanders bystanders. There are no people standing on the, on the sidelines, straddling the fence in this battle. There are no people that are innocent bystanders in this. And you might be here this morning and think, well, I'm not really a believer. I don't know about all this Jesus stuff. I've been in church before. My friends have told me I don't know about all this Jesus stuff. And if what you're telling me is true, if I accept him, then I'm drug into this spiritual battle. So, well, gosh, maybe I'm just better off without him. But understand, there is no DMZ in this battle. There are none who are not engaged in one way or another in this war. No one on the sidelines. There are no innocent civilians. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 12, verse 30. He said, he who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. You are on the team of Christ. You are in his army. You are in the army of the enemy. There is no middle ground. You're working toward the cause of Christ to gather those into his kingdom or you're working against it. Those are the only two sides. No fence straddling in this battle. No fence, fence straddling in this world. Nobody comes into this world neutral and innocent. We are in one army or the other. And I think especially this time of year around Halloween, we have this, this tendency to downplay this whole aspect of spiritual warfare, the demonic activity that is going on. I even think there's a TV show that's it's on right now. I've never seen it. I've seen some ads for it. I think it's a sitcom, a TV show called Lucifer. Where they look at Lucifer has come to live in this world and he interacts with just people in Los Angeles. And, and I think it's a sitcom. We have this tendency to, to downplay the seriousness of this battle. And if you ask many, just common folks, what their conception of hell looks like, that they have this idea where it's just sort of eternity where I kind of do my own thing. Or, or it's eternity, even on the other extreme, it's eternity that's just going to be one party that goes on and on and on. And in their mind, hell is this eternal party, and Satan is the one tapping the keg. It's their idea of maybe what hell would look like. But understand this. The, the battle is very real. Hell is a very real place. Satan is not your friend. He's not just this guy who comes along and invites you to an eternal party. This is the way the Bible describes him. Jesus called him a murderer, a liar, a thief. He's called the tempter. He's compared to a lion who's seeking whom he can devour. He's called a snake. He's not the eternal party host that's just going to allow us to come into his living room for, for all of eternity. Jesus said he is the one who came to kill. He came to destroy. Satan is not your friend. Hell is not a, an eternal party. It's a real place, a real possibility for many. In this army, you were either in the army of the Lord or you were in the army of the, of the enemy. And this army is not one that you enlist in. It's one that you're born into. Every one of us is born into a sinful state, separated from God. We're born into his army, the enemy's army. Romans chapter 5, Paul said there that sin entered the world through Adam and it spread to all men. And then he said these words in Romans chapter 5. He said that before we trusted in Christ, we were enemies of God. 
not in a neutral stance, not in a neutral place, that when I, when I die and I stand before him, God will weigh out my works, and if they're good enough, I get to go into heaven. We don't start neutral. We start out as enemies of God. We start out on the enemy's team. Now, that's not good news, right? <laughs> that's not a good news message. In fact, I was talking to a guy just recently, and he said, you know, I don't hear hell preached often in church, and I think it's because it's not a great marketing tool. It's not great news, right, to find out that we are born into that army. But here's the good news. You can get discharged early. You can get discharged out of You can change teams. You can go from the enemy's army to the Lord's army. A few verses before Paul pointed out that we, were, we are born enemies of God. He said these words in Romans chapter 5. He said, you see, just at the right time, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Now, that's the good news. We're born into that army that is an enemy of God, but we don't have to stay there. We can, be, we can break our enlistment. We can, we can get an early discharge. We can change teams and enter the army of God. And this battle is real, the spiritual battle. It is serious business. According to the website ecology.com, 151,600 people die every year. And they broke that down into, into different statistics. So that is 6,316 people every hour pass on into eternity. 105 people every minute, almost two people every second, and somewhere in the world pass on into eternity. And Jesus said this, that many will choose the wide road to destruction. That means that many of those 151,600 people, if not most of them, will pass on into eternity separated from God for all of eternity. Now, we sometimes think people think about hell as being this eternal party, but think about the worst things that people do to one another. The absolute worst things you read about in the news, or you hear about, they're happening around this world. Think about the absolute worst things that people do to one another. Now imagine a world that did not have a godly influence in it. Imagine a world where God's presence was not. Imagine how bad things could get, and that's just a scratch of the surface of what hell will be like. It's a reality. It's a real place. This is serious business, 151,000 people, and many of them passing in to eternity, separated from God. We can't underplay this. We can't downplay this and say, I can stand on the, on the back. I don't need to get up in the front lines. I can be comfortable in the back. The church of Jesus Christ cannot afford to play church. We can't get in our dress up like a Halloween costume and pretend I'm in the battle. We can't afford to play church. The battle is real and the battle is serious. Now, very quickly, let's take an inventory. What is the armor? What are the weapons? What has God given us? This battle is real and we're involved in it. We can't deny that. This battle is real and it's serious and we have to engage. Now, what has God given us to fight this battle? I'm going to give you your go bag. Take out your hand receipts. You're going to sign for all this stuff here in just a minute. Let's take a look at the inventory, the spiritual equipment God has given us. First thing he says, verse 13, he says, Take up the full armor of God that you'll be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. And then the first piece of armor, verse 14, Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. If you've got the NIV, I think it says the belt of truth. As Paul looked at this guard, this Roman soldier that was there with him, he saw how he was dressed. And in those days, Roman soldiers would wear a tunic, kind of like a dress or a bathrobe. And can you imagine going into battle and your bathrobe's flapping in the breeze? Well, they couldn't imagine that either. So they took this giant leather belt and they wrapped it around their middle. It's what brought everything together so that they would have confidence to go in to battle. The belt held it all together. The belt of truth holds it all together in our lives. And Jesus said in John 17, 17, your word is truth. 
That is the thing that holds it all together. Maybe you're having a hard time holding it all together with your children. And don't you think that the one who created the parent-child relationship just might have something useful to say in the belt of truth? Maybe your marriage, you're having a hard time holding it together in your marriage. And don't you think that the one who created the marriage relationship might have something useful to say? Or even at work. Because I'm having a hard time holding it all together at work. And maybe the one who created work, the one who created that master-subordinate relationship, maybe, just maybe, he's got something useful to say in, that I could hold it all together with. I was talking to a guy just recently, and we were talking about some of the, the things he's heard about God, misconceptions mostly he had heard about God, things he had heard about the Bible, and he said this to me. He said, well, how do I know whether what I hear out there is true or not? And I said, here's how you know. Take your life and wrap it in the belt of truth. That's how you know. Come back to the truth of God's word. And is, are these things I'm hearing true? Are these things I'm experiencing? What does the belt of truth have to say about it? It's what God gave us to hold it all together. And then he goes on in verse 14. Gird yourself with the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, this is not Christ's righteousness he's talking about. Christ's righteousness is inside. His righteousness has been imputed to our account that moment we trusted in him. That's in here. That's where Christ's righteousness is. The breastplate, that goes out here. That was this leather and metal thing that the, that the, the soldier would wear. It protected their vital organs. The breastplate's on the outside. This is our righteousness. What is it that guards our heart in our lives? It's not enough just to say, I, I want to avoid sin. We need to do that, but it's not enough. What am I going to do instead? The righteous is holy living. That's what he's talking about. That thing that guards our hearts. Romans 13, verse 12, Paul said this. He said, lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Now, what does that mean, the armor of light? Well, he goes on. And he tells us, not in carousing and drunkenness or sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Listen, you and I open ourselves up. We open our hearts up to attack by the enemy. And we can protect our hearts. We can protect the very center of our lives with righteous living. Put on the breastplate of of righteousness. And then verse 15. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I want you to notice there. He didn't say, put on your feet, put on the shoes of the gospel. Did you notice that? What he did say was, put on your feet the shoes of the preparation of the gospel. Now that's something different. That word preparation there in verse 15, it means to be firmly established. It means to be fixed. Now, as Paul looked at this soldier and he saw the, the uniform and the, the equipment that he was wearing, he would have noticed the shoes, the, the boots, really, more likely, that the soldier would have worn. And what Roman soldiers would do is they would take these long metal nails, these long stakes, and they would pound them from the inside through to the outside of their boots. Combat then was not like combat now. Now, many of you here are pilots, F-16 pilots, or you're working around those airplanes. And in combat now, you can fly over the enemy and push a button, and from thousands of feet away, you can destroy a target. Or it's even more advanced now. An airman can sit somewhere in the States and stare at a computer, computer monitor and play what looks like a video game, push a button and destroy a target 8,000 miles away. The technology is incredible. But warfare then was not like warfare now. Warfare then was up close and personal. It was hand-to-hand -hand combat. 
And those soldiers would pound those spikes through their shoes so they could dig their feet in. Listen, if they slipped and they fell, they were done for in combat. And it was those spikes, the ability to, to dig in, the ability to stand firm. I think it's interesting. Three times in this passage, Paul tells us, stand firm. And it was their ability to stand firm. That's what enabled them to fight. And he said, listen, stand firm. If you're going to stand firm in anything, stand firm in the gospel of peace. That is the message that through Jesus Christ, we can have peace with God. He said, listen, let that be your foundation. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15, Paul, is, Paul makes this point. He says, be careful what foundation you build on. Now, he's talking to believers there. And he said, be careful what foundation you base everything on. What you are trying to stand firm in. Because the things that we build on in this life very often, he calls them wood, hay, and stubble. Listen, life has a, has a tendency to come along and to destroy all of that. And he said, listen to the Corinthian church. He said, you're not going to lose your salvation. But you're going to watch all of those things that you tried to build your foundation on. You're going to watch them all go up in smoke. He says, build your foundation on the message of Christ. Listen, when we go into battle, that's all we really need. To know that we have been wrapped in the clothing of Jesus Christ, wrapped in Him. If we have doubts, or we go into these battles that are coming in our lives and we doubt and we say, I wonder if God's going to give me the resources for this battle. I wonder if He'll still be with me. I wonder about the promises of God, and will they still be true here? Listen, if we go into the battle with doubt, we're like the man that's standing on shifting sand. We've got nothing to dig into, nothing to stand firm in. And he says, prepare, put on your feet the, the truth, the preparation of the gospel. Fourth thing is the shield of faith, verse 16. Now, how many of you have been to Rome? So you've been to Rome, and you walk outside the Colosseum, right? And there's that guy standing there, and he's dressed like a gladiator. And for the low, low price of five euro, you can have the privilege of getting your picture taken with him. And you remember the, the shield that he carries with him? It's like this little round Captain America jobby, right? And that's what they would use in the hand-to-hand -hand combat, that little shield. But that's not the shield he's talking about here. The shield he's talking about here was, is like four feet tall and about two feet wide. It was an enormous thing. One of the things that was unique about the Roman army that enabled them to be so successful was they really revolutionized warfare in their day. Most armies would just kind of line up and they would come into battle that way. The Roman armies, they took these giant shields and they stood shoulder to shoulder Man to man, it made this giant wall with these shields, and they marched forward on the enemy with those. And the enemy would fire these arrows that were on, they would shoot them at them, they were on fire. And this shield was made of wood, but it was covered in leather really thick, and that leather would extinguish the flames. And his point to them is this, listen, what is it the thing that when, when the enemy fires those fiery darts at us, and those darts look like this. They look like lies. God doesn't have your best interest at heart. God's not going to be with you always. You can't trust in Him. That's what the darts look like. The darts look like blasphemous thoughts. They look like hateful thoughts toward other people. They look like doubts. They look like our burning desire to be involved in sin. That's what those fiery darts look like. And in verse 16, he said, what is it that extinguishes those? Faith. Trusting that what God said is true. Knowing that without a shadow of a doubt that the things that God said he's going to do and the person that he said he's going to be in my life, that without a shadow of a doubt those things are true. That I know that God has my best interest in life. I know that. That's what extinguishes those doubts. Listen, when we sin, you know what we're doing? We're walking out from behind the shield. We're opening up the breastplate and we're saying, here I am, enemy, shoot the fiery darts at me. When we sin, we accept 
them. But when we do what is right, we stand on the, the promises of God's word. By faith, trust that when he said, I'll never leave you or forsake you, that's exactly what he meant. And when he said, I'll provide all of your needs, that's exactly what he meant. And we stand on the promises and trust that God has our best interest in heart. That's when we extinguish those fiery darts of the enemy. I think another thing he saw as he looked at that soldier and he thought about these shields that they used and he thought about this battle and the way they fought in those days. You know, we've been talking in the last several weeks about all of the ways the Bible identifies us as children of God. The Bible calls us the bride of Christ, a family, people, community. So this morning we're talking about an army. You know, there's a one way that the Bible does not describe the people of God alone. Never alone. We're a bride. We're an army. We're a people. We're a community. We are not alone. No doubt as Paul thought about the way the Romans thought, he thought about that. If one soldier took his gigantic shield and he marched towards the front line, it doesn't matter how good his equipment is, he's going to be overtaken. He's going to be overpowered. They were so effective because they were in a line together. If half the army was, on, was in the back sipping espresso, they were Romans. That might have been what they were doing. If half the army was in the back sipping espresso while the rest of it's up front, they were less effective. They were going to be overrun. We absolutely need each other standing shoulder to shoulder, side by side in this battle. And then the last two, very quickly, verse 17. And take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So the helmet is not what brings salvation, this helmet of salvation. It's not what brings it. Faith in Christ alone, that's what brings salvation. And this helmet is not something you can take off and put on. I'm saved today, I take the helmet off, I'm not saved tomorrow. This is not something you can take off and put on. In fact, none of the armor is. If you look at that word up in verse 11, he says, put on the full armor of God. And that word, the, the tense of that word means a, a thing that is done once and done for all. It's not something that needs to be done again and again and again. In Christ, we are in the armor. That's his point. We can't take it off and put it back on. Colossians chapter 3, verse 10. By the way, if you read the book of Colossians and you read the book of Ephesians, you'll notice there's a lot of similarities between the two. Colossians chapter 3, verse 10, he said, We have put on the new man. That new man is Christ. We're covered in him, so to speak. And then he went on to say this there in Colossians chapter 3, that he has renewed our way of thinking. That's the helmet of salvation. That's what it means to, to have on the helmet of salvation, that our minds have been transformed by this relationship we have in Christ. It means that everything that I see, every decision I make, every place I go or places I don't go or things I do or things I refrain from doing, all of that is now seen through the lens of the fact that I am a child of God. That's what that means. Everything I do and everything I say bears consequence for what people think of God himself. That's what it means to have our minds transformed. That's the helmet of salvation, a transformed mind for him. And you do that by the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. I love the fact that he begins this inventory list. He begins it and ends it both with the Word of God, with the belt of truth and the sword of the Spirit, by the way, the only offensive thing in our armor of God, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And we sang it just a few minutes ago, how God hems us in behind and hems us in in front, the psalmist said. He goes before us and behind us. He begins the armor of God with the, with the Word of God and ends it with the Word of God. We were talking about scripture memorization in our home group this past week. By the way, if you're not in a home group, you've got to get in one. These kind of conversations happen every week. And we were talking about scripture memorization this past week. And we talked about the fact that very often we just think about that as something kids do. 
right? You go to vacation Bible school and you encourage them to, to memorize the verses throughout the week and they get some prize at the end of the week if they do it. We think about it in a kid's context. Or they come to Awana and they get Awana bucks for scripture memorization. By the way, another cheap plug for Awana. If your kids aren't in it, put them in it every night, every Sunday night, five o'clock. And if they come and they memorize the verses, they get Awana bucks. And if we talk about it in those contexts, it's good for kids, but we often neglect it in our own lives. But listen, how else are you going to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ? How else but the word of God that is sharper than any two-edged sword, that separates soul from spirit, that gets in there and roots around places that you and I don't even know exist, how else but that, hidden in your heart that you might not sin against God, so that the Holy Spirit of God can bring those things to your remembrance, how else but memorized in Scripture are you going to be able to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ? If that's not been one of your disciplines, memorizing Scripture, let me encourage you to do that. Just take out a three-by-five card and write down maybe just one Scripture a week that you read during the course of your quiet time. Write it down. Stick it in your pocket. Carry it with you. Memorize the Word of God. It is the helmet of salvation that allows us to see this world through God's eyes. Well, let me wrap up with this. Some of you here this morning just need to enlist in the Lord's army. As you, as you heard the description this morning, maybe it's the first time that you came to the realization that, you know what, I'm not neutral in this. I'm not standing in the DMZ. I'm not standing in a way that at that, that, that the end of time I can say, maybe God will see I've done enough good and he'll let me into heaven. Maybe that's the first time you came to that realization today. That you're either on, in the army of Christ or you're in the army of en the enemy. And this morning, you just need to enlist in the army of God. You can you don't need to keep some long checklist, have some long spiritual resume, have done, come to church a number of weeks in a row or done all the right hoops. You can do that right where you are, right here today. Repent of sins and trust in Christ. It's that simple. Let me tell you something. He offers you an eternal enlistment contract. You cannot break it and he will not break it. And then if that's not enough, the enlistment bonus is this, the presence of the very Holy Spirit in your life. Some of you this morning are here, you just need to enlist in the Lord's army. In a few moments, we're going to have our, our time of invitation. And if you've never trusted in Christ, but you're sitting out there this morning, you realize, you know what, he's talking to me. I need to do that. And during that time of invitation, I'll just ask you, just come down here and just say this very simply to me, I need to know Jesus. But there are many here this morning that are in the Lord's army. If you are a believer in Christ, you are in the Lord's army. And the battle is real, and the battle is serious, and some of you are actively involved in that fight. You're out there on the front lines, and you're engaged every single day. But there are some who are hanging on the back. You're behind, significantly behind the battle lines, and you're back there because there's a, there's a timidity in your life. There's a hesitancy or a doubt, and you don't want to engage in the battle. But listen, the armor of God was given to us so that we can stand firm. That's the promise. So let me end it with this this morning. What do you need to do concerning the armor of God? Do you need to put it on this morning, or do you need to take it up? Pray with me this morning, would you? Father, we thank you because you're just incredible. While we were yet sinners, you died for us. While we had no time for you, you had time for us. We had no inclination for you, you had an inclination for us. What an incredible God you are. And then to make it even better, it's as simple as repenting of sins and trusting in you. You impart your very spirit in our lives. Father, I realize that there may be one here this morning. As they really think about it, they say, I've never trusted in Christ. 
And Father, I pray as you have spoken to their heart this morning, convicted their heart concerning sin and righteousness, Lord, I pray that you would continue to do that. Give them the boldness to step out, settle that matter, join the Lord's army. Many of your soldiers here this morning, though, Lord, are hanging back. There's doubt, there's fear, there's a timidness in their lives. And Father, I pray as, as you continue to work in their hearts, reminding them of the incredible armor that you've given us already, that you've wrapped us in. Lord, would you draw them to you? A time of repentance and a time of saying, Lord, give me the boldness to stand for you. Father, as you have spoken to our heart already, Lord, I just pray that you continue to speak to our hearts in these next few moments. We pray in Jesus' name.